Lord, for each and every aspect of our lives. So, Lord, here we are. We come, we gather as the Ohana, the family, because of our great need for you, knowing that, Lord, you meet every need. You provide every need according to your riches and glory. So, Lord, we come with great, great expectation, Lord, of all that you're going to do in our hearts and in our lives. And Lord, as we open your word to our heart, I pray you open our heart to your word. <laughs> Teach us, Lord, by your spirit we pray. In Jesus' name we ask, and all God's people say, Amen. 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 Please be seated. Amen and amen. Well, let's open our Bibles to John chapter 7, shall we? John chapter 7. Uh, last time we were together in concluding John chapter 6, uh, we looked at Jesus' discourse on the bread of life. We saw that Jesus came down from heaven as the true bread that gave eternal life. Now, as we come to chapter 7 in John's gospel, we come to the final six months of Jesus' ministry and his life on earth. Beginning here in John chapter 7, we have the six final months of Jesus' ministry on earth. And what we're going to look at is we see the Jews begin to exhibit their hatred toward Jesus in so much that they wanted to kill Jesus. Now, their desire to kill Jesus was seen back in John chapter 5. But it begins to intensify. And now we begin to see this extreme animosity toward our Lord. So let's pick up our reading in verse 1 of John chapter 7. And we'll read down through verse 31. John chapter 7, verse 1. Now, after these things, Jesus walked in Galilee... For he did not want to walk in Judea, because the Jews sought to kill him. Now the Jews' feast of tabernacles was at hand. His brothers therefore said to him, Depart from here and go into Judea, that your disciples also may see the works that you are doing. For no one does anything in secret while he himself seeks to, seeks to be known openly. If you do these things, show yourself to the world." For even his brothers did not believe him. Well, then Jesus said to them, My time has not yet come, but your time is always ready. The world cannot hate you, but it hates me, because I testify of it that its works are evil. You go up to this feast. I am not yet going up to this feast, for my time is not yet fully come. When he had said these things to them, he remained in Galilee. But when his brothers had gone up, then he also went up to the feast, not openly, but as it were, in secret. Well, then the Jews sought him at the feast and said, Where is he? And there was much murmuring among the people concerning him. Uh, some said, He is good. Others said, No. On the contrary, he deceives the people. However, no one spoke openly of him for fear of the Jews. Now, about the middle of the feast, Jesus went up into the temple and taught. And the Jews marveled, saying, How does this man know letters, having never studied? Well, Jesus answered them and said, My doctrine is not my own, but his who sent me. If anyone wants to do his will, he shall know concerning the doctrine, whether it is from God or whether I speak on my own authority. He who speaks from himself seeks his own glory, but he who seeks the glory of the one who sent him is true. And no unrighteousness is in him. Did not Moses give you the law? And yet none of you keeps the law. Why do you seek to kill me? Now the people answered and said, Hey, you, you have a demon. Who is seeking to kill you? And Jesus answered and said to them, I did one work and you all marveled. Moses therefore gave you circumcision, not that it is from Moses, but from the fathers. And you circumcise a man on the Sabbath. If a man receives circumcision on the Sabbath so that the law of Moses should not be broken, are you angry with me because I made a man completely well on the Sabbath? Do not judge according to appearance, but judge with righteous judgment. 
<laughs> well, then some of them from Jerusalem said, Is this not he whom they seek to kill? But look, he speaks boldly, and they say nothing to him. Do the rulers know indeed that this is truly the Christ? However, we know where this man is from. But when the Christ comes, no one knows where he is from. Well, then Jesus cried out as he taught in the temple, saying, You both know me, and you know where I am from. And I have not come of myself, but he who sent me is true, whom you do not know. But I know him, for I am from him, and he sent me. Well, then they sought to take him, but no one laid a hand on him, because his hour had not yet come. And many of the people believed in him, and said, When the Christ comes, will he do more signs than these, which this man has done? And of course, the answer is no. Now, in this first section of John chapter 7, for you note takers, you outliners, you pencil pushers, there are four things we're going to be looking at and learning about. Four things. Number one, the first section involves the brothers of Jesus. The brothers of Jesus. Uh, that's in verses 1 through 10. Take a look. In verse 1 of John chapter 7, it says, after these things. Now, this little phrase, after these things, speaks of a six-month period of time in which Jesus was in and around the area of the Galilee performing miracles. You say, Clark, how do you know it was a six-month period of time? Well, back in John chapter 6, verse 4, we're told it was the Feast of Passover, which happens in March or April. Here in John chapter 7, verse 2, it's the Feast of Tabernacles, which happens in September, October. So a six-month period of time has transpired. So after all of the things that happened during this period of time that are typically mentioned in, John, in Matthew chapter 14 through 18, Jesus walked in Galilee. In other words, he stayed in the region of the Galilee, for he did not want to walk in Judea to the south there in Jerusalem. And the reason, verse 1, is because the Jews sought to kill him. Now, as we mentioned, the hatred towards Jesus begins to intensify these last six months. Uh, we saw back in uh, John chapter 5, verse 18, after Jesus healed the man at the twin pools of Bethesda, just north of the Sheep Gate outside the Temple Mount, that the Jews sought to kill him because he healed that man on the Sabbath. And here they think that somehow they will determine when Jesus would die. But friends, nothing can be further from the truth. Man would not determine when Jesus would die. God would determine when Jesus would die. In fact, in Acts chapter 2, verse 23, it says Jesus Christ was delivered by the determined counsel and foreknowledge of God. Jesus was going to die according to God's timetable, not man's. And that speaks to the fact that God is in absolute, total control. Hello? Now, I think I'm in control. I think I know what needs to happen and when it needs to happen. I have my calendar, I have my watch. And I can make a, a good determination as to what should happen and when it should happen. And oftentimes, we say, well, Lord, you know, I mean, it's the 29th, and uh, Lord, you've got to do something pretty quick, because the first is coming. And we begin to put this timetable on God, like somehow he's obligated to perform according to our timetable. But the truth of the matter is God's going to orchestrate things according to his timetable. The Bible says in Isaiah 55, 8 and 9 that his ways are not our ways, his thoughts are not our thoughts. And I'm not sure what God has in mind. I'm not sure why he does what he does when he does it. But I do know this. 
that God's in control. And God's sitting on the throne. Ephesians 1.11 says God's orchestrating everything according to the counsel of His will. And when we grab a hold of that, man, there is great rest in that. Well, according to verse 2, it says, Now the, the Jews' feast of tabernacles was at hand. Now, back in John chapter 6, verse 4, it was mentioned that the feast of Passover was coming. That was the first of seven feasts in Judaism. The Feast of Tabernacles is the seventh and final feast in Judaism. The Feast of Tabernacles, or the Feast of Booths, was a seven-day festival. It was from the 15th day of uh, Tishri to the 21st day of Tishri, or the month of September, October. It commemorated God's provision and God's protection for the children of Israel while they wandered in the wilderness for 40 years after the Egyptian captivity. God provided for the children of Israel. God protected the children of Israel. And so they celebrated this, they commemorated this through the Feast of Tabernacles or booths where the children of Israel went outside of their homes. They built little shelters, little booths, little tabernacles. And they lived in them for that week-long festival. In fact, interestingly enough, uh, when you go to Israel today, the Jews in their backyards will build these little huts, these little booths, and they'll actually live in them to this very day. By the way, the Feast of Tabernacles was one of the three mandatory feasts for every able-bodied male Jew to attend in Jerusalem, according to Deuteronomy chapter 16, verse 16. It was the first feast, Passover, the fourth and middle feast, the Feast of Pentecost, and the seventh and final feast, the Feast of Tabernacles. And I hope you're getting this. There will be a test afterwards. Now, according to verse 3, it says, His brothers therefore said to him, Depart from here and go into Judea that your disciples also may see the works that you are doing. For no one does anything in secret while himself seeks to be known openly. Now Jesus wasn't seeking to be known openly at this point. His ministry was still secret, if you will. He wasn't ready to reveal himself as the Messiah and he wasn't ready to die on the cross. They continue in verse 4 and said, If you do these things, show yourself to the world. For even his brothers did not believe in him. Now, clearly, Jesus had brothers, albeit they were his half-brothers, which becomes very interesting because there are those today who say, well, Mary, the mother of Jesus, was a perpetual virgin that she had no other children other than Jesus well the Bible is very clear here we're told Jesus had brothers in fact in Matthew's gospel in Matthew chapter 13 verses 55 and 56 we're told that Jesus had four brothers and sisters plural at least two now the four brothers are actually named there in Matthew 13 verse 55 it was James, Simon, Joseph, and Judas. Now, James, the half-brother of Jesus, because they had the same mother, but of course a different father, he would come to faith in Christ, his half-brother, and he would write the book of James. So Jesus' half-brother James wrote the book of James. Now, his other brother, Judas, is also called Jude. He wrote the book of Jude. So two of Jesus' half-brothers wrote two books in the Bible, and subsequently they came to believe in him. Now, I find this very interesting because according to the end of verse 4, they said, if you do these works, show yourself to the world. The word if, that little preposition in the middle of verse 4 of John chapter 7, is in what we call the first class condition in the Greek grammar. We would say, since you have done all these miracles, why don't you show yourself to the world? Since you have performed signs and wonders, why don't you let everybody know who you are? 
But even with all of those signs, all of those wonders, for the last six months here in the region of the Galilee, according to verse 5 of John chapter 4, his brothers still did not believe in him. And I find that kind of interesting because there are those today who say, well, if I can just see a miracle, then I'd believe. If I can just see some kind of sign or wonder, then I would come to faith in Jesus Christ. That's not necessarily true. Signs and wonders do not cause us to come to faith in Christ. In fact, back in Luke's gospel, in Luke chapter 16, the story of the rich man and Lazarus, they both died. Lazarus went to Abraham's bosom. The rich man went to Hades. The rich man asks Father Abraham, there in Luke 16, hey, send Lazarus back from the dead so that my brothers could believe because if they saw somebody raised from the dead, surely they would believe. But in Luke chapter 16, verse 31, Abraham said, hey, let them believe Moses, the law and the prophets. And if they don't believe the law and the prophets, neither will they believe even if one is raised from the dead. It's not about a sign. It's not about a miracle. It's about faith. It's about faith. That's what causes us to believe. It's faith. In fact, in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1, it says, faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. Wow. The proof, the evidence of things not seen. Now, when we think of evidence and proof, we think of something that is seen. Well, that's evidence. That's proof. I can see it. Well, that's not faith. Faith is believing what we don't see. Well, this section continues. Look at verse 6, dealing with the brothers of Jesus. In verse 6, Jesus said to them, Hey, my time has not yet come. It's not time for me to be revealed as the Christ. It's not time for me to die on the cross. But your time is always ready. Because you don't believe that I am the Christ. You think that I can just make myself known at any given time. They were operating on the time frame of man, where Jesus was operating on the time frame of God. So their time was always ready. In verse 7, he said, The world cannot hate you, but it hates me, because I testify of it that its works are evil. Now clearly... The world doesn't hate Jesus' half-brothers because they don't believe that he is the Christ, according to verse 5. So the world doesn't hate them. But the world hates Jesus because he testifies that the works of the world are indeed evil. You know, as I thought about that for a moment, I thought, you know, this might be a pretty good barometer by which we should gauge our love and devotion for Jesus Christ. What do you mean? Well, it would seem that our love for the Lord is in direct proportion to those who hate us who are in the world. (laughs) And I guess the question for all of us is simple. How much does the world hate you? Does the world hate you? You know, Jesus said in Luke chapter 6, verse 22, He said, Blessed are you when men hate you hate you, when they revile you, when they speak evil of your name for the sake of the Son. Now some of us are really blessed, amen? (laughs) Jesus said, you're blessed if the world, you know, recently when we had the uh, meeting at the planning commissioners for the new property, which we'll have an update in about three or four weeks, Lord willing. We're diligently working on that still to try to overturn that law that outlaws churches. It seems to be heading in the right direction, but in about three or four weeks, we'll have an update for you on that. You couldn't believe the things that people were saying about me, the evil and, you know, well, maybe you can believe it, but... You know, you're a liar, a criminal, a thief, a crook, you're a cheat, you're this and that. And I'm thinking, you know, this is really good. (laughs) I was really blessed that they thought such evil about me because the world hates us as believers. 
And I got to tell you, if they hate us, Jesus said, we are blessed. Well, according to verse 8, Jesus said, no, you guys go up to this feast. I'm not yet going up to the feast because my time has not fully come. But when the, he had said these things, verse 9, he remained in the Galilee. In verse 10, his brothers had gone up. And then he also went up to the feast. Not openly, but as, as it were, secretly. So Jesus wasn't going to go up to the feast the way his brothers wanted him to, openly, publicly, because his time had not yet come, to be manifest as the Messiah. So he went up secretly, privately, because it wasn't time for him to be revealed. Back to John chapter 7. Let's come to a second thing we want to look at. We said there were four. We've looked at the brothers of Jesus in verses 1 through 10. Now let's take a look at the murmuring about Jesus in verses 11 through 13. The murmuring about Jesus. Take a look. In verse 11, it says, Then the Jews sought him at the feast and said, Where is he? They, of course, were looking for him to kill him. And there was much murmuring among the people concerning him. Some said he is good. Others said no. On the contrary, he deceives the people. However, no one spoke openly of him for fear of the Jews. Now, here we see the murmuring about Jesus. This word murmur that's used here is a different word for murmur used back in John chapter 6 in verses 43 and 61. This particular word murmur is only used four times in the entire New Testament. And it literally translates to debate secretly. To debate secretly. And the reason people were secretly debating about who Jesus was, according to the end of verse 13, is because they feared the Jews. They were afraid of the repercussion of the religious leaders. Because in John chapter 9, verse 22, the Bible says that if anybody was going to confess Jesus, they would be removed from the synagogue. In other words, they would be excommunicated. Is it no wonder they were fearful of talking about Jesus openly, publicly? But the point is here, they were debating regarding who Jesus was and what Jesus was all about. According to verse 12, some said he was good. Others said he wasn't good. He was bad because he was deceiving the people. And the point is, these people had a variety of ideas about who Jesus was and what Jesus was all about. And you know, the truth of the matter is some things haven't changed, have they? Because there is a lot of weird, wacky, and way out ideas about who Jesus is. You know, the Jehovah Witnesses believe that Jesus is Michael, the archangel. The Mormons believe he's a spirit brother of Lucifer. That Jesus and Lucifer are brothers, spirit brothers. And they both had an idea about salvation for mankind. So they both pitched their idea to God. God liked Jesus' idea better than Lucifer's, which really ticked him off. So he became the bad brother and Jesus became the good brother. You know, the Muslims believe that Jesus is a prophet, much like Muhammad. The Buddhists believe he's an avatar of God. The Church of Christ Science, which is neither a church nor scientific, they simply think he's a good guy. So even today, there's a lot of weird and wacky ideas about Jesus, a lot of debate about who he is. But make no mistake about it. The Bible is very clear. Jesus Christ is God Almighty. Isaiah chapter 9 verse 6 calls him the Almighty God, the Everlasting Father. In Titus 2.13, Paul said, We're looking for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. In John chapter 10, verse 30, Jesus said, I and the Father are one. In John chapter 20, verse 28, Thomas said, My Lord and my God. In Romans chapter 9, verse 5, He is the blessed God. In 1 John chapter 5, verse 20, He is the true eternal God. In fact, in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 8, God Himself, in speaking to the Son, said, Thy 
throne, O God, is from everlasting to everlasting. Make no mistake about it. Jesus Christ is God Almighty. Back to John chapter 7. Let's come to the third thing we want to look at. We said there were four. Uh, We've looked at the brothers of Jesus, the murmuring about Jesus. Now let's take a look at the teaching by Jesus. The teaching by Jesus in verses 14 through 24. In verse 14 of John 7, it says, Now, About the middle of the feast, remember it was a seven-day festival, seven-day feast from the 15th to the 21st day of the month of Tishri, Jesus went up into the temple and taught. And the Jews marveled. They were amazed, saying, How does this man know the letters or the scriptures, having never studied? Now, Jesus, of course, knew the scriptures because he wrote the scriptures. In fact, Jesus not only wrote the scriptures, are you ready for this? Jesus is the scriptures. What do you mean? Well, in John chapter 1, verse 1, it says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And in John 1, 14, it says, the Word became flesh, and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory as the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and full of truth. Jesus Christ is the Word of God. And it's interesting that they marveled at this because they didn't believe this. Now, according to Hebrews chapter 10, verse 7, the Bible says that in the volume of the book it is written of me. And this becomes very significant. Why? Because I fear oftentimes we come to church for the wrong reason. We come to church thinking, ooh, I hope I get blessed today. Oh, I hope the pastor's on you. No, he so rarely is. <laughs> I hope the music, you know, is just right, not too fast, not too slow. I hope it's not too hot, not too cold. I hope the message isn't too short. (laughs) And we come to church, I think, oftentimes with the wrong expectation, for the wrong reason. Because we want to get something. We want to get blessed. We want to get ministered to. Or we think, ooh, you know, I can't wait till we get to the book of Revelation. Man, it's such an exciting book. And I hope we get there before I die because Pastor Clark's running a little behind these years. (laughs) Or you women on Thursday with the Daniel study. Wow, so exciting. Sally's such a great student teacher and man she knows the way. and we get all excited about all these different things but ultimately listen carefully gang it is all about Jesus if we're coming to church for any other reason than Jesus Christ I think we've missed the whole point of church Hebrews 10 7 in the volume of the book it is written of me from Genesis to Revelation man it's all about Jesus it's all about Jesus everything flows from, stems from, revolves around Jesus Christ. And when we get that, when we understand that, we'll never be disappointed. Well, in verse 16, this section continues dealing with the teaching by Jesus. In verse 16, Jesus answered them and said, Hey, my doctrine is not mine. My teaching isn't coming directly from me, in other words but it's his who sent me. My teaching, my doctrine is from God himself. So, verse 17, if anyone wants to do his will, if you want to do the will of God, he shall know concerning the doctrine, the teaching from God, whether it is from God or whether I speak on my own authority. He who speaks from himself seeks his own glory because he's only talking about himself. But he who seeks the glory of the one who sent him, the glory of God, we know that's true. And no unrighteousness is in him. In other words, in verses 16 through 18, Jesus said, Look, my teaching is from God. 
And if you want to do the will of God, teach the word of God. And if you're teaching the word of God, you're going to bring glory to God, not to yourself. Because everything you say isn't about yourself, it's about God. And everything Jesus taught was the word of God, quite literally. And I think he set a great example for each and every one of us. Because it's not about what we think or what we feel or what we believe. It's not about what laws the legislators pass. It's not about what popular opinion Paul might proclaim. The question is, what does the Bible say? The Bible's the final court of arbitration. The Bible is the line of demarcation drawn in the sand for each and every one of us today. And I think this becomes very important. Why? Because when we have friends, loved ones, relatives, neighbors, co-workers who are going through a difficult time, who are experiencing trials and tribulations in their life, our natural tendency is to help them, to come alongside of them, to comfort and to console them, which is good. But oftentimes we end up telling them things that will ease the pain or the suffering they're going through. What we need to do is make sure everything we counsel them regarding comes straight from the Word of God. It doesn't matter if it takes their pain or suffering away or not because we need to do what the Bible says. Hello? Now a big hearty amen, a holy grunt, anything might have been okay at that point just to let God know you agree with what His Bible says. This is a huge issue because oftentimes we base our counsel on our feelings or what we think or what's popular in the world today. But we need to stick to the Word of God, the Bible to be sure. Well, this section goes on. Look at verse 19. Jesus said, Did not Moses give you the law? And yet none of you keeps the law. Why do you seek to kill me? And the people answered, Hey, man, what are you, crazy? What do you have, a demon? Who is seeking to kill you? Now apparently, some of the people didn't realize that the Jews were seeking to kill Jesus. So in this teaching, he brings up the law of Moses. He says in verse 19, Didn't Moses give you the law? Well, of course he did. Then why are you trying to kill me? If you have the law. Now he's going back to the sixth commandment, by the way, back in Exodus chapter 20, in verse 13. Thou shalt not kill or murder. They knew the law, and yet they were willing to set the law aside to accomplish their own hypocritical plan in killing Jesus, the Son of God. Well, In verse 21, Jesus answered and said to them, Hey, I did one work and you all marveled. We'll talk about that in just a moment. Moses therefore gave you circumcision, not that it came from Moses, but the father. Circumcision came through Abraham in Genesis chapter 17. It was later codified through the law in Leviticus chapter 25 in dealing with the Shabbat or the Sabbath, if you will. Leviticus chapter 12, excuse me. And you circumcise a man on the Sabbath. If a man receives circumcision on the Sabbath so that the law of Moses should not be broken, are you angry with me because I made a man completely well on the Sabbath? Hey, don't judge according to appearance, the the external, but judge with righteous judgment. Now, the point here is very simple. Abraham was given circumcision back in Genesis 17. It was confirmed, codified in Leviticus 12 by Moses. But the problem is that the law said you had to circumcise a male child on the eighth day. So what if the eighth day fell on the Sabbath? What would you do? Not circumcise the child? No, you would break the law. So it was okay to circumcise on the Sabbath, if it fell on the eighth day of the birth of the child. So Jesus is saying, if it's okay for you to break the law to circumcise, why is it okay for me to break the law back in John chapter 5 when I healed the man at the pool of Bethesda? I did one work and you marveled. 
You were amazed because I healed on the Sabbath. Therefore, you wanted to kill me, and yet you're breaking the Sabbath by circumcising on the eighth day. You see the point he's making? So Jesus, in verse 24, says, Don't judge according to the appearance, the external. But judge according to righteousness, what's true, what's right. And this is a great admonition for all of us, by the way. Because one problem we have is we have a tendency to judge others on their appearance, externally. We need to be very careful. Our judgment needs to be judgment of righteousness. You say, whoa, time out. Wait a minute, Clark. Didn't Jesus say in Matthew chapter 7, verse 1, not to judge? Do not judge lest you be judged. For with the judgment you judge, it'll be judged back to you. Oh, yes, he did. You're absolutely right. So how is it that you say we should judge righteously when Jesus says not to judge at all? You guys are sharp. (laughs) The judgment Jesus is speaking of in Matthew chapter 7 is speaking of judging someone's motive. We can't judge the heart because we don't know the motive of people. But we can judge the actions of people. I can say what you're doing is wrong because the Bible says it's wrong. It's not because I think it's wrong or I feel it's wrong or it might be wrong. I can definitively say it is indeed wrong because the Bible clearly says it's wrong. Therefore, it is a righteous judgment. I'm judging in light of perfection, which is the word of God. Read Romans chapter 7, verses 12 and 14. Now, in light of that, we need to be careful. Because the problem is we see a brother or sister who's engaged in some kind of sin and because we, of course, are very holy and spiritual, we're going to go straighten them out, amen? I mean, they are just lucky I happen to be around to catch them doing that. Are you kidding me? Listen, you're just as much messed up as they are. Okay, three of us, fine. No, when we judge righteously, we need to judge in humility with a heart of brokenness and contriteness before the Lord, to be sure. Well, back to John chapter 7. Let's come to the fourth and final thing. Oh my, we have to hurry. We only have 45 minutes left. Number four and finally, let's take a look at the response to Jesus. The response to Jesus. That's in verses 25 through 31. In verse 25, it says, Then some of them from Jerusalem said, Is this not he whom they seek to kill? Apparently some people knew the Jews were going to kill him. But look, he speaks boldly, powerfully. And they, the religious leaders, say nothing to him. They're not incarcerating him. They're not condemning him. Do the rulers know indeed that this is truly the Christ? Now here the people were confused or perplexed about Jesus because of the inaction of the religious leaders. Apparently some knew they were going to kill him. But they didn't even incarcerate him even though it's the middle of the Feast of Tabernacles. He's in the temple and he's teaching boldly. So there was great confusion or perplexity on the, in the heart of the people. However, verse 27, they said, we know where this man is from. And when the Christ comes, no one knows where he is coming. Now, this is not true. This was a tradition of the Jews. The religious leaders said that when the Christ, the Messiah, comes, he's just going to appear. No one's going to know him. No one's going to know where he's from. He's just going to pop onto the scene. He's going to ride on the white horse with a sword. He's going to crush Roman oppression. He's going to right the wrongs of society. He will establish his kingdom in which he will rule and reign in righteousness. Now that is true. But that will happen at Jesus' second coming, not his first coming. 
when Jesus came the first time, the Messiah would know, everybody would know where the Messiah would come from. Because according to the book of Micah, in Micah chapter 5, verse 2, the Messiah would come from Bethlehem, the house of bread, the city of David. So what they're saying was the tradition of the Jews, not the word of the prophet. Well then, according to verse 28, Jesus cried out as he taught in the temple, and he said, hey, both you know me and know where I am from. You know both who I am and where I'm from. And I have not come of myself, but he who sent me, God, is true, whom you do not know. But I know him, for I am from him. Now, Jesus here is speaking with a bit of irony because the people were indeed confused as to who Jesus was and where he came from because of the tradition of the Jews. So Jesus said, look, you know who I am and you know where I came from. And the irony is they did. They knew exactly who Jesus was and exactly where he came from from an earthly standpoint but they had no idea who he was and where he came from from a spiritual standpoint. There's the irony. And the Jews understood it. They knew it. Look at verse 30. According to verse 30, it says, Then they sought to take him. They wanted to arrest him and incarcerate him and prepare to kill him. But no one laid a hand on him because his hour had not yet come. I love that. Once again, we see the fact that man was not in control of the death of Jesus Christ, but God was. In fact, Jesus himself was in control of it. You know, as it pertains to Jesus' life and death, he said in John chapter 10, verse 18, no man takes it from me. I lay it down freely. And if I have power to lay it down, I have power to raise it up again. It speaks to the fact that God is in total control of everything and everyone all the time. Whether we put things in category good or category bad, it's all category God. (laughs) God's on the throne. And just as God, listen gang, just as God is in control of the life and death of Jesus Christ, so too it is with us. God is in control of our life. You think, well, Lord, I think maybe you fell asleep last month because my life's pretty messed up. The truth of the matter is God knows what he's doing. Ephesians 1.11 says he's working everything according to the counsel of his will. Now, just because we don't like it and don't understand it and don't agree with it doesn't mean it's not God's perfect plan for our life. He's in control of it. He's even in control of our death. In other words, we're all going to die right on time. Isn't that comforting to know? We get so worried about the end of our lives, like somehow, I'm going to die too soon. No, you're not. You're going to die right on time. Now, I've got to tell you, first service was thrilled at this. <laughs> Tom got the tape to bring home to listen to it a couple of times. <laughs> just kidding <laughs> kinda verse 31 it says and many of the people believed in him and said when the Christ comes will he do more signs than these which this man d- did of course not if when Christ comes he's not going to do more signs than Jesus therefore Jesus is the Christ yeah and the people believed And believing in Jesus brought them everlasting life. And we've been looking at that for the last few weeks and dealing with the bread of life. But the life that Jesus brings is much more than eternal life. The life that Jesus gives is also temporal life. In fact, in John 10.10, He's going to give us an abundant life. In 2 Peter 1.3, he gives us all things that pertain to life. The life that we have today is a glorious life, 
a life of victory according to Romans chapter 8, verse 37. Why? Because it came from Jesus Christ and precious family. No matter what we're going through, no matter what we're dealing with, no matter how terrible our circumstances may be, and as we look at our lives, listen, I realize we go through some tough times. When we think about the the state of our nation with the coming elections, when we think about the devastation on the East Coast with Sandy hitting there, which by the way, uh, Lloyd Pulley, there at Calvary Chapel North Bri- or Old Bridge in, in New Jersey, is spearheading uh, the um, reconstruction effort for all the Calvaries out there. So if anybody wants to help out and donate anything, just at the bottom of your check, put East Coast, and we'll make sure it gets to Lloyd Pulley at Calvary Chapel Old Bridge uh, there in New Jersey, and they're orchestrating the reconstruction project. But the truth is, hey, things get bad. We get that. But we're going to heaven. And God's on the throne. And we have an abundant life in Christ. It's not about the stuff we have. Man, it's about the life we've been given through Jesus. Father, how thankful we are for these few short minutes you give us to come and gather to turn our hearts toward you. And Lord, we do pray that by your Spirit, you would help each and every one of us to walk victoriously, to rest in that abundant life you've given us, knowing that, Lord, you're going to orchestrate everything according to your perfect will. And Lord, we do pray that by your Spirit, you would lead, guide, and direct us that we would be that light, that hope that would be shared with those who are hopeless. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Shall we all stand together? If you are here today and if you need prayer for anything at all, After service, the pastors will be up front to pray with you, to pray for you, to serve you, to love you, just to minister to whatever need there may be in your life today. And how I pray that God's Spirit would be poured out in your life in a fresh and powerful way as you go forth from here in that abundant life in Christ bringing glory to Him. God bless you guys. I love you. Have a a great week in the Lord.